to affect change in this country, you need a million people and $10 million. We could pull together a political action committee that said, we are all going to agree to disagree on political issues and set those aside. And we're going to focus on one single thing. We will support elected officials, or maybe even appointed officials, who focus first on problem solving, who are friendly, who work with people who disagree with them, and actually try to come to some policy solution rather than arguing about who's going to win the next election or not. I still think there's the ability for we the people to get together and make change. We're kind of following up on a conversation we had with Dr. Herb Lin at Stanford Suver Institute a couple of weeks ago, where we stumbled on this notion that perhaps corporate power in the world is on the rise and that we're facing a point where on earth, something like 70 out of the top 100 economic institutions are corporations, not countries anymore. And so if this trend continues, humans are kind of asking the question, where does this lead in terms of their ability to really pull the levers? Or is that even a danger? And so we'd love to hear your story and get your take on the idea. And okay. so, yeah, if you want to just maybe introduce yourself and tell sure. us a bit about your experience. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And let me just briefly answer the question. Yes, I think it's a huge danger. And I say that as someone who is... I guess the term is multi-potentialate, renaissance man, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, one of my friends calls me the modern day Thomas Jefferson in terms of somebody who's interested in science and nature and life and politics and government and human society, the whole gamut. Um, yeah, we're Thomas Jeffersons too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I never expected to see a world with three of them in one room. <laughs> see, this is why we need to bring back cloning. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway. That's an aside. Um, and, and I take this from a perspective of, you know, I'm, I'm a political moderate. And I take pride in that. And I'm not, the, I'm not the moderate that I'm right in the middle on every single political issue. It's depending on the issue, I could be very liberal, very conservative, somewhere in the middle, just based on my upbringing. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, just outside Peoria, Illinois, spent summers on my grandparents' farms in Nebraska, um, you know, came from that very sort of, how'd I put it? A combination of staunch democratic Catholic families in middle of rural, of, in the middle of rural America and the sort of um, small town Republican types hmm. together, you know, and the first, actually, the first political campaign I ever worked on was for uh, Representative Bob Michael back in 1984 when I was in high school, who later became speaker. He's one of the last, I sort of think, um, I'm trying to come up with some nice way to put it. One of the last true Republicans. Hmm. The best and I think, you know, I think that our country, as an example, our democracy has always worked best when you have people on all sides of the political issues, all ideologies, arguing passionately but respectfully, arguing about the, the actual issues and solving problems rather than who's going to win or lose some political argument, and who understand that democracy functions best when we are all equally miserable. <laughs> okay. You know, um, I look at democracy as sort of a midpoint between socialism and complete libertarianism hmm. or at the outer extremes, fascism and statism. You know, it's, there's a reason why our U S constitution starts with the words, we, the people. It's us making the decisions, you know, 
yes, we can blame a lot of people in Congress and political leaders these days, but it really comes down to us because we're the ones putting up with that as voters. And but, is that what got you into law in the first place? It, it was, yeah. I mean, I started out um, when I was getting ready to go to college. My dream was to become an aerospace engineer and design fighter planes. Whoa. Yeah. And because I had taken all sorts of advanced math classes and physics classes in high school, aced them all, you know, national merit scholar, the whole works. And got to college at Oregon State University and utterly failed calculus and physics by first year. Well, hmm. And nearly dropped out of school. But um, instead, I kind of jumped through a few different majors and settled on biology with a minor in genetics and focusing also on some Russian studies work. But was the math just too abstract and unrealistic to you? or I, I think it was. I... I had really great teachers in high school hmm. and you know, when you're in one of those big cattle car classes mm-hmm. in university mm-hmm. where you're one of 300 people with a bunch of pre-meds and yeah, you know, it was really tough for me to adjust. You know, I think had I like, had I taken a gap year or two and learned more about how to learn, I think I would have done better, hmm. you know, but I don't regret it. You know. So you got into biology. Got into biology and got into graduate school and was studying forest genetics hmm. and realized, which is wonderful, great. I had a great major professor, professor at Oregon State, Stephen Strauss. Um, he might be somebody you want to interview someday, too. Um, yeah. He's got a fascinating take on sort of environmental policy and issues hmm. from his work in forest genetics. Um, but realized after two years that I didn't want to be a professional research scientist. You know, I admire people who are like like people who dedicate their lives to that work, I think are amazing, but it is, it's like living the life of a monk, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you constantly are just writing papers and grant applications and, you know, doing research and everything, but again, another topic there, but I, um, after that, I took a, an interdisciplinary master's and took a couple of years to figure out what I wanted to do. And my advisor for that master's program was a professor named Bill Lunch, who you may have heard him on Oregon Public Broadcasting from time to time as a political commentator. And I think he gave me the best piece of career advice I've ever received, which was, Joel, you're a generalist. Law school is the last refuge of the generalist. <laughs> well, maybe we should go. To, maybe we should go to law school when we get to Earth. I I encourage it for anybody who's interested in Anything. any sort of work involving the crossover of different areas of study or different areas of life. Hmm. You know, I'm still tremendously fascinated and interested in science, but a lot of my interest in and the focus of what I wanted to study was how science relates to politics or to government or to um, religion and spirituality. It's the lever. Yeah. It's the lever that you can pull in order to actually affect change in a way that if you spend your life devoted to scientific monkhood, Mm -hmm. you might make a discovery, but Mm -hmm. if somebody uses that discovery in a way that needs to be controlled by law, you can't do anything about it. Right. And, and there is a, there is a prevalent mode of thinking in science. I guess is the best way to put it or paradigm, if you want, of our job as scientists is to investigate nature and that's it. We are not concerned about what's, what people do with our scientific findings and how they turn it into a technology and then mm-hmm. how they use that technology. We're pure, you know, we're pure thinkers. I think it's the quest for objectivity, really. The quest to unbias oneself. Yeah, that I think is fantastic. But you need to have people around the edges who understand the science, but can cross that bridge into appropriate public policy. Totally. And how we use science in society for our benefit, according to our government, our politics, our system of living. So how'd you get into that? What was the sort of first step that took you 
So you went to law school, I take it? So I went to law school, yeah. And um, as I was going through law school, sort of my interest shifted to policies around human genetic information. Well, Like the interdisciplinary research I'd done was on looking at the Human Genome Project hmm. that started back in the 90s as a political and government institution. Well, um, and how we use human genetic information at that time for, you know, everything from insurance purposes to advising people on genetic diseases. And my idea was I'd find a policy position somewhere after law school. And instead, um, I made a mistake of pursuing the job I thought I should take rather than the one I wanted to take. Mm. Like I looked at everything I'd built up and said, well, I can't waste all this time I've spent studying the science and the law, I should become a patent attorney, mm. which I did. And it was, again, fascinating work most of the time. The part I didn't like was as a patent prosecutor, like the person helping people file patents with the U.S. Patent Office and or internationally and working through that. It was that scrivener aspect. You were just writing and writing and writing and writing. Writing and writing and writing and writing and, you know, and chatting with my supervising partners and fellow attorneys about wordsmithing at a, such an infinitesimal degree, it drove me nuts. Mm, um, because the wording had to be so tight to protect the patents. I yes. See. Well, yeah. To give you an example, um, there's this is this is kind of the a fascinating part of patent law, actually. In the patent claims themselves, that's the key language. And then the rest of the application kind of supports the interpretation of what those claims mean and what technologies they cover or don't cover. There is a different, a very significant legal difference between using the term comprising versus the term consisting of. Wow. wow. Okay. In regular society, those are pretty much equivalent. We use those interchangeably if we use them at all in social conversation. What's the difference? Well, comprising is an open-ended statement under patent law. So it comprise, if you have a, a widget that is comprised of four elements, that claim would cover any widget that has those elements plus any others tacked on. Mm. If there are 17 elements involved or aspects, it would still cover it. Consisting of is a limiting phrase. It's only those four things. So in order to infringe a claim that someone has, a the, inf the accused infringer would only have to, would have to include those four items. That sounds exhausting. Else they would escape coverage of the claim. It just sounds exhausting. Yeah, it's exhausting. I, again, I really admire my friends who are patent lawyers. Um, I wish I had that talent sometimes, but um, yeah, just wasn't my thing. How long did you do that for you? I did that for about five years, wow. including my time working there while I was, I worked there as a clerk while in law school. All right. So you tested it out. You were like, this is not, okay. this is not the field for me. Right. And that's a fast mistake though. Sometimes people go for like 10 years on a mistake. Right. And there are a lot, and there's, there's also the prevalence, especially among attorneys of you spend your entire career for 20 years doing something you hate. Mm -hmm. And I just, I couldn't do that. I was yeah, that's alone. a conversation in and of itself. You encounter people all the time who are like, man, I wish I had done this other thing. I guess right. it's too well, late now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, some costs. Um, so then I ended up getting one of those job offers I couldn't refuse from a friend of mine, Peter, in Washington, D.C. I went and did science and technology policy in Washington, D.C. for a few years. Um, and worked for a couple of government contractors because that was a big effort at the time. This is the early 2000s during the first uh, George W. Bush administration, not H.W. back in the 90s, but George Bush 2000 to 2004. Um, and I worked on, for example, there was the, it was an international consortium of space agencies that shared data they collected from scientists. Hmm. Uh, particularly around natural disasters. So there are these complex agreements where, for example, if there was an earthquake in Turkey, the U.S. would shift some of its satellites from NOAA or NASA 
and you know assess what was going on use use radar or a specific type of radar to look for ground fluctuations after the the, the earthquake or use um infrared sensors and this is based on a sort of shared interest in the outcome yeah. or shared interest in outcome so the agreement was um, each space agency said, okay, we will devote a certain amount of time to task our satellites if a natural disaster occurs in a particular area. That way, you know, if, for example, if, if none of the satellites in the U.S. had a particular instrument that would have been, that is necessary, would be really important for measuring some natural disaster or some aspect of the surface of the planet or something else. Gotcha. We could share that. It was sharing of resources. But these were owned by countries or private owned institutions? Owned by countries, yes. Gotcha. So in the U.S., it was NASA. Um, and a lot of people don't know that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has, I think, at least as many as satellites as NASA, if not a lot more. Hmm. Um, but increasingly, these satellites are being owned by private corporations. Exactly. So yes. how do you think that's going to change the game? Um, I think what we're, the trend we're seeing is the privatization of information. Hmm. And that's kind of what our conversation with Herb Lynn was about, where there is he works on cybersecurity and cyber warfare, and he made this really interesting point about the way that security almost requires privatization because that's how you trust people because you're inside the same group. And because you're inside the same group, you're like, well, these people have access to this information. And so we know that everyone here can be trusted. Can we try Right. I think we see that the same same in our intelligence agencies and our government. Okay, we entrust certain people in the CIA, the National Security Agency, the uh, National Reconnaissance Office. Speaking of satellites, to collect this information and safely guard it and use it to protect our security, our national security. But when it's with a government, at least there is some type of mechanism or apparatus in place for us to either get that information directly or make sure that our representatives in Congress are able to review it. Right. So our trust, like I I get what he's saying. I agree with that. It's more of a direct trust. I think he's like, you're basically going to have to pay for trust, which is an interesting story because you know, in a world where corporations have more power than people, they're the only ones who can afford to pay for trust and everybody else is kind of just, that's the fear anyways. I don't know if that's what will happen, but I'm interested. Well, I can give you one example that, that really concerns me um, on this topic. And I may, have to do, I may have to confirm the details of this, but I recently read a news report about some people in who use uh, Apple iTunes and have purchased music over many, many, many years, purchased, okay, losing their accounts for violations of Apple's terms of service mm. and no longer having access to that library of music. And I, this even happens to me, like when, when I download a song rather than listening to it on Spotify or I download a book to my Kindle, my immediate thought is, oh, I'm purchasing this for myself is if I bought a physical book, right. from Howells, or you know, went to everyday music and got bought a CD. But it's not the same. Really? I'm not purchasing that entity. I'm purchasing a license to use that thing subject to the provider's terms of service. Uh. And that license can be revoked at any moment if you upset yes. the wrong person, right? You upset the wrong person. Corporations change their terms of service all the time, and we're responsible for reviewing them. Well, what's really and, interesting is they're not, they are persons, right? According to the law, but they're like yes. these super persons that have the resources of more than groups of people, more than, you know, domestically yeah. organized states, even in many cases. Well, I do highlight like that, that now we're kind of on the topic of the concentration of wealth and not just inequality of 
pay and salaries, but inequality of wealth. I mean, we're in power. We are on the verge of being a new neo feudalist society. Is the mm. way I would put it. Okay. And did you see the roots of this? When you were working in Washington in the early 2000s and oh, yeah. you've kind of watched it develop or were you blindsided by it a little bit? I would say a little bit of both. Hmm. Okay. Like I could see, like I saw the trends. I'm just not, I can't predict the future. What are trends did you see? Uh, trends in, well, first of all, like we're talking about shifting government resources to private contractors. Hmm. Well, that's military contractors civilian contractors, like moving the expertise from the agencies themselves out to private businesses. Fascinating. Right. And this is on okay. the basis of efficiency or, or something else? I would say the proponents of, of, of private contracting focus on efficiency. They're the other ones who say that, you know, government should run like a business, sure. like business efficiency. I think government should run like, our democracy should run like, the constitution says, mm. which is slow and inefficient. Mm. And so as to be careful. Yes. Um, that was one trend. The other trend, and I think this is the most alarming trend to me, was the way that political communications are carried out. What do you mean by that? So I look at um, nine, the, like the mid-90s as sort of a, a, a demarcation point or watershed moment. All right. Before then, and if you look at how people in Congress, for example, or even in Congress and the White House and administration, talk to each other, argue with each other, yes, there was some undercurrent of nastiness sometimes. All right. Or, um, yeah, there were a, a small number of people who were really there just to pursue power. But most people were focused on solving problems. You know, most people devoted themselves to government service hmm. to try and help make the country a little bit better. All right. Um, when Speaker Newt Gingrich came to power, he, he by that time, he'd spent a few years in Congress in the House of Representatives. Who goes by Newt? And, Hmm? I said, who goes by Newt? Newt, I know. Is that short for Newton? I can't remember. It, I can't remember if it's short for Newton or if it's, it was his actual birth name. It's very witchy. Yeah. Is he a witch? No. Oh. He's not a witch. Well, at least I don't think he is. All right, all right, all I, right. I'd be surprised if he was. Okay, so Newt comes um, to power. Yeah. So he comes to power. Um, although maybe somebody should turn him into a Newt, but that's another <laughs> Okay. Um, so he comes to power and... He had formed um, the Conservative Political Action Committee, or CPAC, and he put out a series of cassette tapes about how to learning how to speak like Newt, mm. because he was a very effective political communicator, hmm. especially when he ran for election. Okay, but his mode of communication relied on a few principles, such as one. Never acknowledge an opponent's question. Whoa. Okay. Never, never answer qu their question directly. All right. Prevent answer the question that, that you want to answer. Okay. Mm. Um, two, never acknowledge the worth of your opponent's position. Well, wow. Okay. Their position is not only baseless, it's evil. Wow. It is anti American. Mm. If you don't agree with this narrow interpretation of American conservatism, you are the enemy. Hmm. Right. Um, never allow your, your opponent a chance to speak. Hmm. Okay. If, you know, if you're structuring up a debate, interrupt them all the time. Hmm. Um, you know, things like that. Who did he learn this from? From the tapes themselves. I mean, I, I bought. Or, or who did Newt pick this up from? Is there Just a tradition of this or? Well, I, I think his experience and taking some of the trends that arose in American conservative conservativism from the civil rights era through the Nixon administration. It's also the way of internet dialogue, right? Yes. 
So th there's this yeah. other thing, which is the spread of the, I was reading some report, I think it was the Rand Corporation that was about writing about cyber warfare. And they mentioned the rise of the troll ethic. That's it. I think Newt Gingrich is at least the fairy godfather of the troll ethic. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, you can draw a straight line from him. This is all very pagan. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you can, you can draw a straight line from him to what we're seeing in the modern Republican Party, which, in my opinion, lost being conservative several years ago. Hmm. They're reactionary and fascist. Hmm. And I think some would uh, argue that the Liberal Party lost being liberal as well. Yeah. I mean, the, like we're seeing the same tussle in the Democratic Party, which, you know, again, another topic is um, there was a study from the Pew Research Center uh, about eight years ago that I found really interesting where they looked at how do you segment American society by political ideology? We've gotten in the habit of blue states and red states, mm. you know, or even at the level where people like, get a higher resolution down to a county level. Sure. We but have still blue and red, red counties, blue, blue yeah. and red precincts, and some states appear more purple. Well, really what we have in, in America today is 14 different tribes. Wow. I'd love to see that study. Uh, I will send you a link. Excellent. It's really interesting. We'll put it in the uh, description. Yeah. When I talk about, you know, kind of, I don't know what you say, political evolution with students in various classes. This, I point to this. There's also a, a really interesting article from uh, the Plus One Journal from 2011 about um, an analysis of Congress based on what they called super connectors. People in Congress on the House or Senate side that bridge that gap between both parties. Mm -hmm. The number of people who pulled together and would work on legislation with groups of Democrats and Republicans. And they came up with a great way to visualize this with something that looked like the nucleus of a cell, mm. you know, with the stratas of all the proteins and everything. But they did an analysis over time from roughly 1970 up to 2009. And when you got to that Newt Gingrich era, the visualization changed completely. It went from sort of a blob with, with red and blue edges, but a lot of connections in between to something that looked like mitosis. Yeah, the two mm -hmm. cells were separating, basically. Yeah, it was. And that's the way Congress works these days. You know, it's not, it's not a unified body of people who agree to debate. And so it, yeah. you have this rise of polarization, you have the dominance of the troll ethic from the internet. And at the same time, you have a massive rise in the power of corporations. And it yes. seems like all those trends would be at least distracting enough so that the corporations could continue unabided. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, I think what we're seeing is it's a breakdown of common government institutions. Mm. And if people can't get what they need or want from their government, they're going to look elsewhere. They're going to look to churches, neighborhood groups, families, other communities, and corporations. You know, if, if I can't get health insurance to cover my illness from the government, that's affordable. Okay. What are my options? Go to my church if I belong to one. Well, we've seen, you know, as an equally significant decline in religious participation, right? My groups of friends. We've seen an equal decline in social networks. You know, there was that famous study about bowling leagues from 15 years ago. What you was know, it? I don't uh, think I know it. It was the, the, this, I found it really interesting. There was a group of researchers who looked at the breakdown in social networks according to the number of bowling leagues in the country and how back, you know, starting in the World War II era when bowling really got popular, okay, bowling night was a common occurrence. I grew up with that. 
You know, I went bowling in high school. Mm. I participated in a couple of bowling leagues. That was a thing you do. Or you went roller skating, mm. or things like that. But they use this as one measure and how they correlated the number of bowling leagues and bowling alleys in a really sharp decline with a sharp increase in survey responses where people said they felt more socially isolated mm. or they felt their networks of friends collapsing. And, you know, just, and these bowling leagues were disappearing? Disappearing, yeah. So it was like an, an indicator. It's almost like an, the equivalent of an indicator species in a, an ecological collapse. So people were basically isolated to a degree that they suddenly had no strong social connections. Right. And that means that there's a lack of political organizing. And so that means that someone who can organize, who has a lot of money, such as a corporation, can come in and be very, very effective while people are lonely, isolated and very ineffective. Yes. And what's interesting is that, I mean, originally we kind of planned to talk about this in context of science. Mm -hmm. And in the sciences, it seems like there is this tendency to kind of bury your head in the sand and focus on the science. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of political awareness. There's not a lot of lobbying. There's not a lot of discussions of, well, there should be a scientific political movement. Mm -hmm. And so where did that kind of come from like why are people that are even in these groups that ostensibly should be working together so politically dominated by the corporate structures well i wish i had a good answer to that question um uh, i can point to a few things mm -hmm. um first of all there are there are some groups out there that are still advocating for science one that emerged in the past decade or so roughly was a group called, I think, the 314 Committee, if I remember right. Again, I have to look that up and confirm it later on. We can edit this out, by the way, right? Okay. <laughs> um, we'll just post the links in the description. No worries. Yeah. People, okay. people do this all the time. All right. Um, they're a group that are, their mission is to get more scientists into Congress and into leadership mm. positions generally, Okay. So people who understand science who are also the policymakers. That's the piece that we're missing, I think, because in this sort of polarization that we're talking about, we're also seeing a polarization of people who trust science, believe in it, and think that that should control. Okay? That if there's a scientific truth, that should be a truth in all regards. Right. And it's what it's they like hyper rationalization is, almost. Almost. Yeah. Um, what they miss is that, as I put it in politics, there is no truth. Truth is where you find it. You know, politics, we, po our truth in politics is what we agree to in a democracy. Well, there's been a fascinating way of talking about the differences between, say, people on the left and people on the right, mm -hmm. where I I got my hands on this book called, I think it's Enchanted in America. Yeah, really good book, yeah. And well, what's interesting is that there's this delineation of intuition and rationality that mm -hmm. they lay out, right? The argument is that there's more people that are making decisions on the basis of intuition on the right than there are yeah. on the left. That's true, but... We can't just, it's not exclusive. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that was, that was the point that I was going to make is that there's this tendency to look at it as an exclusive thing that if you believe in science, that there's this rational, non-intuitional decision that you can make. But the reality of it is, is that decisions are much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That is exactly it. You know, it's, it's that aspect. Like when I, when I, um, I worked in the U.S. Senate as a Senate staffer for a decade as in as state council and a constituent services director. Cool. And constituent services is the problem solving aspect of a legislator's office. It's the constituent services kick in when somebody calls in with more than an opinion to share or a request that the legislator vote a certain way. It's I need help from my government. Hmm. 
it's rooted in our First Amendment principle of we have a right to redress of our grievances with our governments. And legislators, as our elected officials, have a responsibility to help us with that. So things like, you know, uh, I'm helping my cousin apply for social security benefits and they're having a rough time in the social security administration. Or I filed a Freedom of Information Act request and I haven't received a response. Hmm. Or my, you know, I'm going to marry my, my wife. She's from Brazil. We're having trouble getting the right immigration visa in order to have our marriage ceremony. All right. And I got, you know, a lot of experience with people who on this point would call in and start talking about, you know, the anti-vax movement, chemtrails, 5G radiation, you know, all of these, these worries. I'm sorry. Worries. Yeah. Worries, concerns, like, yeah, there's concerns. And yes, there is scientific information underlying all of these, but if, if you don't understand how science works, of course you're going to rely on your intuition and take that information in the context of whatever people are telling you on Facebook. Well, there's a lot of profits being made talking about these exciting, scary things. I mean, fear sells, really. In addition yeah. to fear selling, there's also the fact that if you don't know much about statistics and math, but you do know a little bit about history, you can pretty easily look back into history and be like, well, the history of science is that science uh, yes. is usually wrong. And so you're telling me that they're not wrong now, but they were wrong. All wrong. the time before. So what makes it different? And there's plenty of bad actors, you know, all throughout the history of science too. Just like any enterprise, there's going to be cool. folks doing the wrong things and getting slapped for it and moving on. Well, and, and even like, even the bad actors had some good aspects to them. Okay. You know, you look at, go back in history a century, Henry Ford, you know, Henry Ford at that time, the Henry Ford was an absolute fascist who supported Nazis in Germany. Mm. And he was a very strong advocate of eugenics. Mm. Yeah. He did okay. some gnarly stuff in South America too, I think. Yeah. Right. You know, yet we can criticize him for that. And for those, I would call them character flaws, you know, acts of evil, whatever you want to say they are, but we can recognize that he's a, he was a brilliant industrialist. Sure. You know, who essentially created an entirely new industry from scratch. Uh, there's an argument to be made that I think people look at that and they're like, well, maybe what he created hasn't been, isn't very good for us now, right? Right. Yeah. It's, no, I mean, if you look at the, the use of fossil fuels over the time and the contributions of the auto industry to global warming, to auto accidents, lack of trains in your country, lack of trains in your country, disruption of sort of cohesive city planning and making walkable cities and walkable neighborhoods and encouraging communities, particularly like, you know, the American highway system devastated black neighborhoods. You know, I mean, think of the loss of like what, could have been generated in terms of knowledge and culture and appreciation society and you know, all those lingering effects. Um, you know, now we're into the realm of environmental racism, you know, and environmental justice. Um, and so, so this brings up such an, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, so, go ahead. so this brings up such an interesting point, which is this obsession with growth. Like if we're like, yeah. Oh, well he did create lots of growth economically. Yeah. That means he's not a bad guy. Right. And right. it's like, well, what's up with this obsession with growth actually? Right. Why, why do we, why do we measure the success of like, like you, we started off with, okay. The 70 richest, you know, entities in the world. Yeah. We're looking at a set, the, the version of gross domestic product or the corporate domestic product, the corporate revenue. Revenue. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, actually, to be fair, it's, it's the, it's the, the top like 10 are all countries, but the top 70 out of a hundred are corporations. 100. Yeah. Okay. 70%. Walmart is 
Number 11. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That doesn't surprise me. Right. Okay. But yeah, like why we, we, we've, we've grown up at least since the beginning of the country, if not earlier, with this idea that we have to grow to, we, growth is good. Well, I think we're starting to see a bigger change in that though, um, both in other countries and even here in the US, um, where people are saying like, if there's one thing the pandemic has taught us is not only how little we need to just survive as people and have a good life, but you know, questioning all the crap we used to put up with prior to the pandemic. Mm. You know, the focus on you know growth as a country economically, but failing to look at improvement by other measures. Why aren't we focusing on improvement in terms of um, education? Well, this uh, or imp- Permanent above personal happiness. Time spent with your family. Yes. Time spent with your family. Versus time spent commuting or. Yeah. Or, um, you know, how I lost my train of thought there, but there are so many other measures we could look at. Well, the reason Um, I think that those measures aren't considered is because the dominant player in the current market organization is the corporation it's not a human yeah it doesn't have those human interests yeah there's no way to consider that the the standard corporation is focused on one thing and is required to do so by law exactly that is benefit shareholders and shareholders benefit by increased profits so isn't there a case to be made that they really aren't people um yes because a person a big, could never survive if that was their only concern. Well, and I think like like the idea of corporate personhood, okay, was created as a way to oddly enough, it was created as a way to address corporate excess. Hmm. It's how do you like how do you hold from a legal perspective, how do you hold an entity responsible and um Responsible to the law. Yeah. Okay. Well, if your only choice is to revoke their corporate registration as a punishment for egregious behavior, it doesn't give you a whole lot of options. All right. But um, so my take on like, why, you know, the question, why did we come up with corporate personhood uh, originally? It was a great idea at the time. Mm. And over the century, over the decades, and now more than a century, we arrive at the point of the famous or infamous Citizens United decision from the Supreme Court. Um, that I think went too far philosophically, if not legally, into not just our corporations independent persons and independent entities but they are now we've gone full circle you know based on that corporate personhood they're now trending towards being beyond the reach of the law Mm -hmm. it's it, it, it it's part of the question of why if we go back to the housing crisis that started in 2008 and the great recession we know now and we knew at the time that there were people intentionally stealing people's money, victimizing them with outrageous mortgage agreements, and using that money to gamble in the market to increase profits for the people they work for. And this is an and, open secret. Like this wasn't yeah. undercover. This was out in the open. Right. And then so, the government sort of demonstrated that they had been corrupted by this influence by sort of buying these folks out or, or paying, you know, what's the word? So yeah, buy, buy out, I guess. Yeah. It, it, and the question is, so why Bail did, out. why did nobody go to jail? Well, you know, maybe one low level of person from what I remember went to jail. Okay. No one, no one was put in jail. No one was individually fined. Well, even like, people going to jail or getting fined isn't going to stop the corporation. They'll just swap the person out. Right. It's like if you like took one of my atoms out, it wouldn't stop me from being here. Right. But there are ways to constrain corporate behavior still. 
like yeah, the, let's like, talk about that. You know, Ralph Nader and the the what was the the car that kept exploding on impact? The Nova. <laughs> was it the what? It, it wasn't it was the Nova. It wasn't. Was it the Nova? Again, I'll look that up and we'll provide a link to that. So but, there was a car that exploded on impact. Yeah, car that exploded on impact. Wow. And Ralph Nader took a record. This is probably one of his first most famous cases. It led to the formation of the public interest group around that time, hmm. where he was able to prove that the manufacturer made a conscious decision to say, yes, we know that this design is defective. There's a high risk that the car is going to explode if someone, if it's involved in a rear end collision where somebody hits it from the rear. But we've done the economic analysis. We have run the actuarial tables and we think it's more profitable if we do nothing. Just pay the fines. Yeah, it's more profitable for us to settle court cases from people who've been harmed or their estates than it is to fix the problem. But that's basically the standard mode of corporate operation. Like, yeah, pure, pure economic analysis. Well, what's really crazy about it is if I wanted to blast somebody, I couldn't just, I, I'm assuming when I get to Earth, if I wanted to blast somebody, I couldn't just pay my way out of it, right? Nope. So humans nope. are sort of held to a different standard. That's exactly it. Okay, it's in that case with the, with the auto manufacturer, the courts were able to step in only because there were a certain number of people who refused to take the settlement. Wow. Right. But after that, we saw an increase in the government of better protections for consumers, you know, better product testing, um, better consumer protection overall. Okay. But then in more recent history, in the past couple of decades, that's slid backwards. So you need another exploding car, basically. Yeah, you need something to wake people up. That's what it comes down to. You need something dramatic, um, you know, to, well, like with, with the mortgage and housing crisis. Okay. At least that led to some federal and state laws that prohibited things like um, egregious penalties for early payoff. All right. Or... Uh, balloon payments or some other things. And it required better disclosure of mortgage terms. Um, we also saw that in the credit card industry mm-hmm. around the same time, where if you look at credit card statements now, there's a very common format. It looks like it looks akin to a nutritional label. Huh. Right? That was because Congress passed a law requiring that and mm. said, for the benefit of society, we need to make sure that people understand what they're getting into when they when they start using credit and what incentivized the actors in congress to bring forth that bill we the people so folks got together and oh, yes. pushed on their representatives yeah representatives senators you know you could say congress members of congress covers both both chambers we have representatives in the house of representatives and senators in the senate so what you're saying is that people really can reach out to their representatives oh, yeah. or, or senators and, and put the muscle. I would, say, I would say that is true for the vast majority. And I'm, I'm being careful here, okay? Because what I'm trying to avoid is we have a tendency in, in, in discussions and debates to say the Republicans are awful. Sure. It's the okay. reverse of the Newt Gingrich mentality. Yes, it's it's a generalization of everybody. Okay. Like every single person who's a member of the Republican Party acts and thinks the exact same way. And we can look at concrete information almost from a scientific perspective and, and know that that's wrong. Just recently, we've seen Representative Liz Cheney versus the Republican leadership in the House. And that Pew study that you mentioned of the, it was 17 tribes, 14 tribes? Uh, 14, if I remember right, yeah. Well, so that's exactly the sort of quasi-scientific statistical yeah. confirmation that you need to say something like that. Right. You know, so I would say like, and I've worked with a lot of legislature, legislators here in Oregon, a lot of members of Congress over the years, 
Um, I've had interactions with other elected officials back home in Illinois and Nebraska, you know, and I still to this day believe that most people in those roles are trying to help people solve problems. Hmm. The exception these days is everyone who's in the Republican leadership in Congress, whether it's Senator Mitch McConnell or Representative Kevin McCarthy and their cohorts, and just about every Republican elected, elect, elected member of Congress. And I say Republican intentionally, not conservative. Hmm. Yeah, they have nothing to do with conservatism these days. Hmm. Right? But it's like a brand that's taken over an ideology. It is. Yeah. Um, and it's really strange and very upsetting sometimes. But I still think there's the ability for we, the people, to get together and make change. And Here's what does that look like? One specific like? example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If, if we could get 1 million people across the country. So a third of each, a percent, basically. Yeah. Yeah. A third of a percent. Okay. 1 million people, relatively small number. Right. There's more people who, who you know, um, follow influencers on TikTok. But one million people each able to donate an average of ten dollars each to a new nonprofit organization called the Responsible Gun Owners of America. We could get gun control legislation through Congress pretty easily. Hmm. Or we could take, or we, or even better, if we could get one million people to all join the NRA at the same time, we could take it over. Hmm. Wow, that's a crazy idea. Right? I assume right. you're I coming mean, out of that from like a safety angle too. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean... What stops this from happening? It seems, it seems on one hand so easy, and on the other hand, it seems wildly difficult. Before well, people we get have this real feeling that they don't have power. They do. Yeah. They do. It's... It's, it's the, whether you want to call it mass media or social media or the Facebook effect, or we are, we are pounded on a daily basis with so much information about how we individually are hopeless. We have no power. Government is corrupt. There's nothing we can do about it. Right. And it takes a really conscious effort, not only to examine the source of information that we're getting, but take time to critically analyze whether that's true. Okay. I can personally say that during my time in the Senate, I would have a conversation with someday and they would bring up a question or a topic that would highlight a problem. I go to my fellow staff members, we'd discuss it. We'd put together something for the Senator to look at. He'd take a look at it. He'd put it, he'd sponsor legislation and it would pass Congress and there'd be a change in the law. Hmm. You know, um, one, one specific example I can think of is uh, there was a veteran here in Oregon who called in and complained that his food stamp benefits declined when he got an additional benefit from the, from the VA, the Veterans hmm. Administration he gained a benefit called aid and attendance, which is a, a relatively small program through the VA, but it's to help desperately poor veterans with aid in their lives. The vast majority of veterans who qualify are in nursing homes, retirement homes, adult foster care homes, like it's somehow institutionalized mm -hmm. or they need that extra help. There were, it ended up being about 10,000 veterans in Oregon, like this individual, who were still living on their own. They just wanted help from a nurse or a house cleaner or a cook to come in occasionally during the week and help them out. And it didn't seem right that if they got more money here, they'd lose money over here. And we looked into it. And it turned out that there was just a simple mistake in one of the state processes where they counted aid and attendance in, in a way it wasn't supposed to be counted. Mm. Like it shouldn't have affected the guy's food stamp benefits. Okay. Mm. But because of that, we were able to contact the right state agency, 
say, hey, I think you might be making a little mistake here. Could you take a look at it? Mm. They did. They came back and said, yeah, you know what? We're sorry. We did this. It helped this guy and 10,000 other veterans. Mm. Or So maybe the things that people are worried about could be solved quite easily. They can be. I mean, there are, it, there are mechanisms in place. I think one of the biggest dynamics, I don't know what you would call it, like the reason why we have this problem of feeling so isolated is because people don't understand how government works mm. or how it's supposed to work. Um, that was the big realization I had in the Senate. I mean, I, I kind of knew when I started working in the Senate, I knew that people, most people didn't have a very detailed understanding of government. You know, those famous surveys were only... 15% of the country can name one Supreme Court justice, mm. you know, or half the people surveyed can't even identify who the president is right now. All right. I'm not talking about that. That's trivia. I mean, the things like if I have a complaint about my neighbor's tree falling on my fence, who should I call? Probably oh, call your neighbor. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll call the neighbor. But then if they aren't going to do anything, uh, do I call the police? Right. Do I call city some city government office? Do I call my U.S. senator? Do, do I, I buy a chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, do I buy a chainsaw? You know, do I call a lawyer? Um, all of the above. All of the above. Maybe options. Right. It's, so what's the best way for people to get connected to that information? Ask... Ask someone who knows, you know, call, mm -hmm. call your local of official's office and say, and this is what I mean by we, the people. Okay. The typical response in most legislators offices is because everyone is overworked and stressed out and harried is if a person calls in and it doesn't deal with my boss or this office, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, um, Sorry, not my problem. You have to call somebody else. Click. Senator I work for refused to accept that. And that's one of the reasons I admired him. I admire him so much and why I work for him was he understood, look, most people don't understand how government works. They think it's monolithic. Like there's the government. And if you just call one person, that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. So we're going to work with them at the place they are and then get them where we want them to be. So when people called in and said, hey, my neighbor's tree fell on my fence. I want the senator to come over and fix it. <laughs> okay. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm about to lose my driver's license. I want the senator to call the DMV and fix it. Or even a lot of cases, you know, I'm in a child custody battle in court. You know, my ex is lying to the judge. Senator Merkley needs to come into the court hearing and tell the judge what's going on. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I took it on myself to say, okay, um, you know, Senator would love to help, but he doesn't have the power or authority to do so. Let me get you to the right folks who can help you. And let me explain how this part of this out of government works. So in the future, you know where to go and you can help your friends and neighbors go there too. I love that. So yeah. there's a lot of patience that needs to be cultivated when someone a approaches lot of the law. Needs to be cultivated. And I mean, this goes back to what you said at the beginning about how you, you kind of prefer a government that's sort of slow and careful to one that's just hasty and pushing yes. you into a quick solution that might not actually government. accomplish what you want. We have very efficient governments in the world today. They're called dictatorships. Mm. <laughs> okay. True. North Korea is an incredibly efficient government. Mm. You know, Russia is becoming more efficient day by day. And that yeah. makes sense since that's one of the more ancient forms of government. Yep. <laughs> so it government should be slow to make sure everybody has a chance to participate. Because there's things more valuable than efficiency. Yes. Yes. And those things are spelled out in our constitution. I love that. Yeah. We, the people in order to provide a more perfect union, meaning we're trying to be a better government than, than where we came from, you know, with a focus on individual liberty and property ownership, but also the general welfare. You know, those three words appear throughout the Constitution, or at least in the preamble, I should say. Mm. 
you know, and that's why we have the government we have where there's the separation of powers, but also shared powers. It's, it's, cro- it's checks and balances. It's cross-checking each other. It's a way to provide confirmation of data yeah. in sciences, you know, that we use in sciences. So if, unless you have any more questions, Quinn, I wanted to ask one final question that I ask all the humans that we talk to at the end of our conversations. No, go for it. Yep. What do you think is the most challenging thing you've, your species, you and your species face in the next, I don't know, 100 years, 10 years, 10 minutes? What's the biggest concern for your species on your planet right now and in your own just human not your professional but just your human opinion my human opinion and i will while i'm thinking of an answer i will say whenever you make it down to our planet let me know because i'll be interested to hear what your experience is (laughs) (laughs) for sure we're waiting for Um, that pandemic to close down before we land yeah (laughs) hopefully any data I would have to say the the biggest threat to humanity right now is the rise of totalitarianism. Mm. Yeah. It is, and, and I, I say that specifically and intentionally. We should say okay. the reemergence, right? Because democracy yeah. is basically a toddler. Democracy is on, de- on decline, yeah. It's it's a toddler, right? If we look at the uh, throughout human history, from you know, what are they say now? Thirty thousand years ago, yeah. It's done recent reports I've seen. Um, yeah, I mean, but the and birth of agriculture, which is like twenty ten thousand years ago, eleven thousand. Well, it's years interesting because they kind of tried it out in Greece and Rome to some extent, but it did collapse back into totalitarianism pretty quickly. Yeah, it did, and I think like like we throughout history and even the U.S we're never at a fixed point. You know, it's always a a, a pendulum that kind of swings back and forth in between any two measures. The, the fear I have is that, okay. I, I predicted Donald Trump would get elected in May of 2016. Hmm. Right. Which really upset a lot of my friends. There's how could you even believe that? I'm like, because I, I am a reluctant cynic. I'm not a pessimist. To me, a pessimist is someone who always looks at things negatively. A cynic is someone who wants to be an optimist, but the facts keep getting in the way. Sure. And I was like, you know, when my friends and family back in the Midwest of my extended net- social network are f- favoring Donald Trump, he's going to get elected. All right. Yeah. You can see uh, the wave on the horizon. And yeah. denying that the wave is coming is going to do very little. Right. Do you take that as it, a sign of fear about totalitarianism in the Democratic Party or something? Or? No, I, I like totalitarianism has taken over the Republican Party. We no longer have we no longer have a large, active, conservative movement that, in really good faith, is trying to solve problems in the country. And trying to work with people from other ideologies and other ways of viewing the world mm. to solve problems. They don't want a diversity of viewpoints. Okay. I think the best, pr- the best way to tackle problems is to get a variety of people in looking at it to come up with some different aspects of a good solution. Yeah. And try a little bit of everything. And that's a right? good litmus test for are people looking for yeah. solutions or are people right. looking for control? Because if they're not willing to consider other perspectives, then obviously they have to be looking for control, right? Right. It's all about power. It is all about consolidating power, winning political arguments where a win is denying your opponent, your enemy, anything. Okay. Which is exactly what Mitch McConnell said he was going to do with the Biden administration in the past week. Well, that, like, Senator Mitch McConnell is the worst thing to happen to American democracy in my lifetime. Well, That's my opinion. Okay? And this all goes back to the Newt strategy. It's a direct line to the Newt strategy. It is, it is the Republican leadership deciding that solving problems wasn't their job. And coupled with that, the people who voted for them let them get away with it. 
We should call this the eye of newt strategy from here on out. <laughs> the eye of newt string. Yeah. Like I, I mean, it, for me personally, I've stopped voting for people who agree with my political views. Fascinating. Right? That is really I, fascinating. I will vote for people who demonstrate a commitment to problem solving, even if I disagree with them 60% of the time. Wow. Yeah. I, I like that. The, the senator I work for, I disagreed with his politics most of the time on any number of issues. Okay. But in addition to his commitment to helping people and his, he was one of the smartest people I'd ever met. He was one of the most dedicated people to one of the most, sorry, one of the people most dedicated to actually digging in and trying to help everyday folks. Okay. Not corporations, not interest groups, not the people donating to his campaigns. Okay. It was how can we help the people he represents do better? And he, he's demonstrated that, you know, okay. if, and there are, and there are folks, there are still folks on the Republican side, or at least on the conservative side who want to do so and are dedicated to the same thing. It's just, that's an incredibly small number these days. So finding ways to grow that number seems like yeah. it would help with the totalitarianism that's looming. Yeah. If we, again, I come, I come back to the million people model. Okay. All you need to, to affect change in this country, you need a million people and $10 million. So that's a third of a percent who can give $10. Yes. All right. It's pretty good. And if we could pull together a political action committee that said, you know, here's a million of us, we are all going to agree to disagree on political issues and set those aside. And we're going to focus on one single thing. And that is we will support elected officials or maybe even appointed officials who focus first on problem solving, who mm. are friendly, who work with people who disagree with them and actually try to come to some policy solution rather than arguing about whose bill should pass or not, or who's, who's going to win the next election or not, or any of those things. You know, it almost I, feels like there's a whole discussion of strategy for encouraging those behaviors, and especially in people looking to get involved in politics. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and I'm like, I've been doing this work since, I guess, the first really substantive political work I ever did was 1992, where I was a campus organizer for the Concord Coalition. It was a group at that time dedicated to reducing the federal debt and the federal deficit. Hmm. All right. I mean, I, in politics, I'm old and I'm tired. I, I, I mean, I really am. But it's the people who are, you know, the millennials, the Gen Zers, like the folks, you know, that are now becoming aware of how politics works that invigorate me. They are going to be the solution. Definitely. And if they put their pennies together, it sounds like they could actually move a mountain. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could move a mountain. There, it's still... That way, it's just, we have to remember that when we talk about we the people, that is both a right and an obligation. Mm. We have the right to participate in democracy. We have the obligation to do our homework to effectively participate. It's kind of like, you know, maybe that's another factor we're focused on. A lot of people focus on rights and liberties. You know, government can't tell me what to do. Okay. Well, yes, that's true, but we don't do a good enough job talking about responsibilities. Yeah. What do you owe in response to those freedoms? Yes. Yes. You have the right to free speech. You have the responsibility not to hurt people. And if you, if you speak hurtfully, you will suffer the consequences. Mm. You know? Yes. You have the right to bodily integrity. It's interesting because the internet's kind of made people think that's not the case. Yeah, I think it's true. I think that's the troll effect is you move from a three or four dimensional social participation to a flat screen. Mm. You know, I even do this myself. Like I, I participate on a, a couple internet forums 
and my personality, my character, the way I come across there is entirely different than the way I am in, in real life. Well, yeah, it's, it's, because, yeah. it's transformative. It is. It, I fall back to, I don't know if it's laziness mm. of, I'm just going to make, you know, funny little quips here and there. And I'm never going to see these people again. And you know, right. what's it matter? What do, I, yeah. what do I care if I piss them off? <laughs> so, I don't go that, I try not to go that far. Now we begin to see the violence inherent in the system. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it goes. Yes. Women, women lying about in ponds. Indeed. Man, well, there's so many threads to pull in there. Um, I'm sure we'd love to catch up with you down the line and, and pull sure. on some of them. Uh, this is a lot to think about. So maybe we should just end it there. And yeah. again, thank you so much for joining us. We, no, no, we really appreciate really, all your work. I really enjoyed the conversation. Y'all are doing a much better job than most earthlings I know. Um, so oh. thank you for the opportunity. I'd love to come back. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joel. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.